Well, good evening again, folks. This is uh, part two of Tank Week, and we had Gareth Davies yesterday talking about the development of British tanks in the 1920s and 30s. We're going to continue this week with Niels tomorrow, Pritt Thursday, and um, Philip Friday talking about other aspects. But tonight, we're going to be talking about the little guns inside the big vehicles. And how this came about is I was sort of looking for a show to fill in the week, and various people kind of didn't come through, and long story short... I contacted Rich and said, I want to do something about machine guns in tanks. And the interesting thing is there's not that much information out there about them, which is we'll, we'll go into that in the show. But the reason I contacted Rich is I've known him for somewhere around 25 years. And um, we're going to just talk about machine guns in tanks. So welcome to the show, Rich. How are you doing? Evening. Good. Thank you. Um, a little bit perplexed at how little there is to quickly find about you know, secondary and secondary weapons and small arms in tanks and armored vehicles. So, yeah, if I look tired, that's why. Yeah, so I apologize to everybody for um, putting you on the spot with, what, two two days, three days notice. But that, yeah. it, is, it is interesting, you know, because since, since pretty much anybody had tanks, they've had machine guns in them. I mean, in, at one point in the Great War, that was kind of all they had in them at some point. And all the way through 20s and 30s, They've had the Caraxa machine guns, other machine guns, fitted anti-aircraft ones come in later. And and yet, it's as I said in the description for this show, we'll learn out what they were they're meant for, what their primary purpose is, um, how are they supposed to be used, and what you have turned up is that there isn't that much there. And you know, it's not like you haven't been able to draw on a lot of information. You've got a lot of books on tanks, a lot of manuals, a lot of primary source information, and there isn't a lot out there. So so to sort of start us off, why why do you think there isn't much out out there? I think probably people are distracted by the fact that you know there's a lot to tanks, and if you start to think about small arms particularly, you or, or specifically, what, why would you bother um, trying to understand ju tank elements of that? So you know, surely they're just the same uh, the, as infantry weapons and things like that. And in looking at uh, uh, you know, we do have a, a lot of different material here in the collection, and uh, for for reasons of um, gifts and be bequests, we've got a lot of tank material as well, uh, which includes some really eminent sources that you sort of think, okay, I'm going to go and look up, um, you know, secondary armament, and it's going to tell me what what they're used for it's going to tell me what different tanks had it um had different armament in and it's going to tell me about the development because there are some specific developments in tanks uh and by tanks i do sadly mean all armored vehicles i think um we'll probably open up a can of worms with that one but i'm just going to say tanks for expedience on this mm. like most people just say machine guns and they actually mean a lot of things um you know that, that frustrates me every day so that i can frustrate somebody else for a change the um it, it, it's one of those that you, you quite rightly said you know the female tanks of the great war the mark one and the mark two um, had just uh, you know, the female tanks just had Vickers guns. Uh, the secondary armament you could probably argue on the Mark One was the or, or on those on the male tanks was the Hotchkiss and the Lewis guns. Yeah. Um, but but principally, yeah, they were just machine guns, and that's how you know, the twenties and the thirties develop as well. And even right up until the Second World War, you know, picking up on what Gareth was talking about yesterday with armored experiments, um, well, you've got tanks that are purely machine guns uh and you've got them where because the armor on other tanks is so light so you've got an ability to fire a normal rifle caliber round and then you've got a heavier uh, anti-armor or armor piercing round that can fight lightly armored tanks so small arms development machine gun development really does you know, sort of track armored vehicle development but they're just to say i've i've you know, textbook of small arms 1929 primary sources tank training manuals that we've got um available military training pamphlets uh on not just the weapons but like cruiser tank cruiser troop training um you know tank employment mobile division pamphlets all of those things they miss out some really uh, key elements and so there's a gap there you know we're trying to you know as i try and do in good academic terms i'll try and exploit that gap um mm. and perhaps pick up something after this talk uh you know and get some stuff written down because yeah i think there's some gaps there not just on 
the technology uh, and, and how that develops and why be, we perhaps choose certain things, but also about that you know, tactics and employment as well. Mm. Because, you know, for those who don't know, and the links are below, you know, you've got your Vickers Machine Gun Association and Archive. You put all this information out there. You've got an incredible YouTube channel. Again, the link is below there. And one of the, I don't want to use the word weakness in terms of machine guns in front of you because you'll hit me virtually through the screen. But the problem with mach media machine guns, lots of stuff to carry around, lots of stuff to yeah. move about, you know, ammunition, tripods, uh, cooling gear, blah, 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 blah. And then you put a machine gun in a tank, and I'm being very, very basic now. It's moving. It's mobile. It's protected. The stuff you're carrying for it is kind of stowed beside it. It's actually almost a perfect environment for a machine gun. It, it, you know, when you looked at me before we went live, we we're talking about the middle sex in Normandy. And, you know, if someone's got to pick up tripods and move them forward, and you, you can't be in every spot at the same time. But, you know, you have eight Sherman tanks, perhaps, for example, moving across a field, every one with a coaxial machine gun and a 30 or 50 on top. Yeah. Suddenly, you've got an incredible amount of mobile firepower, forgetting about the main armament of the tank itself, depending, of course, on what you're using the tank for. Because obviously this is coming into the infantry support type arena more so than a tank on tank. Um, well, I, yeah, that, that's well. an interesting point, and I, I'd pick up on you know again. You know, hopefully people are watching these as a series, um, yeah. so you know, they will have had a chance to watch Gareth's, if not um, now, but before um, before you watch this or, or dip back into it. But Gareth talked about you know cruisers and infantry tanks, and and I think that comes down to the role of the machine gun in the tank as well. So you know, principally, you've got protection of yourself. Uh, from infantry, you know, your machine gun will do that. I think there's an element of protection of, from yourself uh, from armor as well. So, you know, when you are engaging with your main armament, you know, the, the, the whole gunner does not just sit there and, you know, do nice things or not, neither does the operator if they're, if they're not busy. Um, they will be you know, saturating the periscopes, the, the weak points, making sure that that other tank is hold down. Yeah, you know, they, they, they will be making Commanders sure. Commanders inside turrets, that Absolutely. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. suppressing yeah. that. And 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 also, um, you know, in, in infantry and armour cooperation, they'll be suppressing the infantry that are supporting their armour. So you've got protection protection of the tank itself, perhaps for the crew, for the for the quick moving tanks, and say for the for the cruisers. But then the infantry tanks. Um, you will have the support of the infantry. So like you say, you know, Sherman's going across that fi you know, field, a troop of four Sherman suddenly has eight machine guns, it can, at least eight machine guns it can bring to bear to support the infantry, plus the he um, high explosive ammunition of the main gun if it's needed. But you don't necessarily want to use that unless you really have to. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 yeah, those seem to be the main, um, the main functions of uh, the machine guns on tanks, you know, probably quite obvious you know protection of yourself and support for the infantry that you're cooperating with as well so you say we haven't found much what have you found let's start with what you have found um yeah and then when we've got that 30 seconds done we'll we'll just waffle yeah. for the rest of it but no what have you found well 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 i think that, that there's a bit to be told about um you know how, how i've gone to look about this uh and you know, trying to look at not only the technology, but then how it's used, the logistics and everything, because that perhaps explains some of the uh, some of the demands on tanks. And uh, it, it's worth sort of talking through the guns in the first instance. You know, what mm. was used? So the twenties and thirties see the Vickers machine guns being used. So you know, that's probably why you 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 thought. I might be a, a suitable guest. Um, and a lot of this research and a lot of the sort of the, the knowledge that I have is as a byproduct to my research about the Vickers. And and, and you've got up there the, the manual, um, you know, one of those manuals that we've got in the collection. It's actually about, this is this is the manual for the 75 millimeter gun. Uh, but it shows the range of weapons there. You know, what military training pamphlet number 32, 35 was Royal Armoured Corps weapons. And you can see right smack bang in the middle there, number six, we've got Vickers machine gun, 0.5 inch mark five and that's this rather large beast behind me it's a 0.5 inch um round it's not a 0.5 inch uh, not a 50 cal round which is probably worth sort of showing there you know in this hand um is the 50 cal browning ammunition and in this hand is the 0.5 inch vickers ammunition so although that top bullet is the same you've got a lot lower um you know lower velocity in, in the 0.5 inch than the than the 50 cal and, and remarkably the the 50 cal browning 
um, was developed before the 0.5 inch Vickers. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that develops over time. Uh, we decided to go for a shorter stubby around uh, than than the 50 cal Brown in, in there. But the um, so yeah, so the 50 cal the, the 0.5 inch Vickers is what's developed and probably you know isn't. Uh, you know, if we were to call this secondary armament for machine guns, that was never used as secondary armament. That was the main gun for the light mm. tanks right up until the Mark 6B. You know, the Mark 6B in 1940 is the last uh, tank to see the 0.5 inch uh, Vickers used. It then gets relegated to um, uh, a, a, to long range desert group use and, and, and things like that. Um, but you can see, yeah, you can see there, Malta 1942, 41, 42, I think that photo is, you know, the 0. 0.5 inch Vickers being taken apart on the front of the Mark 6B. It's, um, it sat alongside the 303 guns. So I think the next photo that we've got is the training uh, set up for, uh, the, for a Mark 6. And you've got the point the 0.5 inch sat next to the 303 gun so that you would be able you know, so the gunner was operating both you know they have a pistol grip they're operating both guns at the same time um they or you know, depending on targets so they're able to saturate a target with 303 use up plenty of ammunition on that and then if they've got an anti-armor target that they want to uh, want to hit then they've got the 0.5 inch option there yeah and, and this is all you know say late 1930s this is the peak of machine guns in tanks as that main armament, because it's it's penetrating about 12 to 13 millimeters of armor, um, depending on angles and things like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, Panzer III, and, and somebody asked me this in one of the Q&A videos I did recently, uh, the Panzer III, I think it's the C, once you get past the C, you know, it doesn't, um, it won't penetrate the armor on that. It will penetrate the armor on quite a lot of tanks in the middle, uh, quite a lot of Italian armor. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll come on to the Sentinel in a moment because that's all. Yeah, so I'm getting ahead. Yeah, yeah, it's all right. Um, it, will, it will sort of penetrate uh, a lot of Italian tanks um, in the armor. So you see those guns last a bit longer in the Middle East. Um, you know, and I know Gareth sort of talked about your know, different places for different guns. The 303 inch guns that you've got are just the same as an infantry gun, largely. Um, and one of the the reason I have the one above my head here, you know, sat on the tripod is because of that next tank. So if you go on to uh, the Sentinel with its uh, phallic cupola for the, um, you know, the, the, the machine gun there, uh, which, which, which appears as a comedy item many, many times. It does. And, I've seen that on YouTube, many on uh, Facebook and Twitter, making yeah. lots of jokes about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what hides a Mark 21 Vickers machine gun. Um, the Australians developed it themselves. They then decided that, you know, we, we don't need that. We've got enough lend lease, uh, lease lend tanks coming across um, Sherman's and things like that. We don't need to develop our own tank. And therefore, we don't, need to develop our own tank gun as well so they were just converted to infantry guns so the one above my head is a mark 21 converted to a mark one infantry gun no longer needed and that's the last time the vickers appears in in tanks um and it goes on to be replaced by the bisa so the next um next photo is that bisa machine gun a uh, really bizarre there's no lines to it it's not very arty if you it's ask not going to get used in a star wars film is it no, it's not. There's it's just, it, yeah, it's it 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 looks like a Lego gun <laughs> to me. Like how when I was I was actually um um booted out of playgroup when I was about five for making guns out of stickle bricks and Lego, and that's the kind of thing I would make, um, yeah, and get, yeah. get my mum in trouble over. So, so you cock that by pushing the trick by pushing the pistol grip forward as well. So that's one of those guns that you give to somebody and they just haven't got a clue how to use. It's amazing, um, but it but but it had been developed through the thirties. So what we've got to remember is as we're developing armor and everything, and all those armored experiments are happening, we're also developing the technology. So we're switching from the Lewis gun to the Bren. Um, we're we're mechanizing the British Army. We are giving them you know, universal carriers or brain gun carriers, machine gun carriers, all those things. And we're looking to change our medium machine gun as well. So the Vickers medium machine gun in both the infantry role, the armored role, all of that is looking for it to be changed. So we look to the BISA uh, to replace all, all, all of that. Um, and you know, we're, this is in 7.92 millimeter Mauser. 
it's really interesting that we are adopting a caliber at the end of the 1930s that is different to what we've just converted the Bren into. Um, we try this in 303. It doesn't really work. Um, you know, for, for various reasons. We try to use it in the infantry role, and because it's an air-cooled weapon now, there's no water jacket, uh, it, no water in a barrel casing there. It's just you know, air-cooled, slightly heavier barrel um, for, for this. But it, it it's one of those that we decide we're only going to put in armor. We like the gun. Um, probably the most trickiest bit about this is it uses a... To, to fit it in the box... The number of rounds that fit in a box of ammunition that's like a standard size and we're not deviating from it um, is 225 rather than 250. So that's like the most difficult thing about the BESA that seems to permeate through the Ordnance Board mimic, minutes is, well, should we go to 200 or should we stick with 225? Or, you know, they just get so bogged down in the minutiae, which is which is hilarious, actually, because there's so much if they perhaps... People put, getting bogged down in minutiae when it comes with machine guns, whatever next, Rich. Who I mean, knew? How would that ever be a thing? <laughs> yeah, it's not fashionable. Um, but but perhaps if they'd have put more effort into you know looking at three or three ammunition and and um, you know what we'd have ended up with this in the infantry role as well. Um, so I've got if you uh, click over to the next slide there. Um, this is like a a, a a coronavirus briefing by Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> this is the yeah. <laughs> um, this is the infantry sort of thing that tried to be cobbled together uh, because we were looking to, to replace it. So Beza was going to go throughout, and you know, seven point nine two millimeter was going to be the standard ammunition for the British Army's machine guns. Uh, they never tried. They, they could have easily retrofitted the um, Bren back to that as well, which is quite interesting because obviously we changed it from seven point nine two to three oh three to suit us, and then went oh, wait a minute, we can't change the visa, so maybe we'll have to change it all back. Um, but they just said, no, actually, you know what, we're going to stick with the Vickers uh, in the ground roll, and the visa would end up going into armour only. And it does replace the, the it replaces the 303 gun, but it also replaces the 0.5-inch gun as well, and they developed the 15 millimeter. Um, ammunition for the visa, which is a monster gun. It's over six foot, um, six foot long. Uh, it, it's, I think it weighs something like 126 pounds. You know, the, the, the 0 0.5 inch Vickers, even when it's full of water weighs about 80 pounds. So they've added loads of weight in there. Um, a lot of that is metal to help it absorb, uh, absorb the heat. Um, but the Beezer is what replaces the Vickers in the British tanks. We'll come on to the Brownings uh, in a minute. Um, but it then is is the gun that exists throughout uh, the rest of rest of the war in the likes of the Churchill, uh, the Valentine, the Cromwell, all, all of those British design tanks. Um, it has some nuances, though, uh, and you know it does have to be sort of regularly cleaned. You, there's some, there's a sort of series of photos that I've included um, for the uh, you know cleaning the visa, setting up you know in front of their church. It was a great photo there. You can see that you know it's all in its parts. Um, this is one of the high res photos from the Imperial War Museum. Uh, what it also shows that we'll talk about in a minute is a Bren gun sat on top of that Churchill. Um, yeah, with its with its with its hundred round. round. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that you know, the Bren gets used quite a lot uh, with armor um, as an anti aircraft weapon. So you know, we we clearly need to have some kind of protection from aircraft, and we can't elevate our Beezers and every other gun that we've got. So we do uh, you know carry around that quite a lot. Um, uh, and I said you know, some of the nuances and intricacies of things. Beezer ammunition, a bit like three hundred three, but one of the tasks that the guys had was to make sure those belts were dry. And if you're in a vehicle and you're moving ammunition around and you've already opened the boxes and stripped um, you know, these little cardboard things out that keep it all in place, then I'm afraid you've got to reset your rounds on a long stop. So if you're stopped for longer than 20, 20 minutes, one of your jobs is to you know, make sure all the rounds are in position because it will cause stoppages. So this photo and the next one um, show guys stripping all those ammunition belts out and then putting them straight back in again as well once they've checked through them. So, you know, it, it, one, of, one of the things that was really telling is I, I looked through a few personal accounts as well. Like, um, they, you know, David uh, David Render, um, his book, Tank Action, and uh, 
oh, there's another one as well that I can't quite remember. Um, troop leader, I think. And, and they don't mention mm -hmm. any of this stuff, which again was that whole nobody's mentioning the machine guns in the tanks yet. It must have absorbed so much of their time to do this kind of task. So, you know, it, it's interesting that. Well, that's the paradox, isn't it? I mean, yeah. if, there, if, if there are photos taken of this, it's because someone wants it photographed for some reason. These aren't propaganda. They're because they're examining the work or how long it's taking. Um, they're all going into action with ammunition for the, gun, the guns. The guns are well maintained. Um, and yet there's no reference to them, particularly how they're meant to be used. I, I just, obviously the anti-aircraft side of things, I can understand you, you know, if there's, if something comes over and it's got black crosses on it, shoot at it. There's not so much in the way of, you don't need to prepare people for that particularly because every situation is going to be different. But with the in, in terms of the coaxials, the machine guns, surely there's there's got to be some different ways of using it and how do the orders get given? And I, I, I'm intrigued that this this there isn't more about it, or at least it hasn't been found yet. Yeah, and one of the things I, I didn't mention actually with the Vickers, um, one of the remarkable pieces about, so the Vickers is a fully automatic machine gun. You know, there is no selector lever on a normal Mark I Vickers machine gun. Yet on the tank guns, there was. So on the tank guns, you would fire single shot or um, you know, or automatic. So selector lever above the feed block there. It's the only time it appears, which... You know, the manuals tell you how to change it and you know how to repair it and what it does, but they don't tell you when you're using the selector um, for rapid or or, or or for repetition or for automatic. So you know, again, trying to think about that uh, a little bit differently. If you move away from the protection elements, because nobody's using sing nobody's using machine guns as um, sniper weapons. Um, you know, if if you start to think about why would you switch back to uh, a repetition uh, round, another function comes up, which is potentially ranging. So, you know, we have ranging guns on, you know, 50 cal um, ammunition that's, again, sort of slightly longer than the Browning uh, ammunition. But you have ranging guns on some modern tanks and, uh, you yeah, they fit alongside the main battle tank. So, it's something to look for. It's something to consider as to whether these were being used as ranging guns as well. So, or, or, and for target indication. You know, well, I was, I was just thinking about target indication yeah. because if you know, I was commanding a troop of Sherman tanks and and because I've been the, I'm the commander, I'm the one with my head out the turret, I'm the one looking through the binos and I've spotted that there's a, a German anti-tank position in a hedgerow and I wanted to identify where it is quickly to my, to my, my buddies firing machine gun rounds at it might be a good way of pointing it out to the other gunners um yeah. but then so, you'd think if it was a good way and had and was used that way frequently again there would be something written down about this some some officer would have written about that at the battle of so and so goodwood or something he'd have said i found an effective way of of target indication was to have my machine gunner put ammunition down there on on target but if something hasn't if that hasn't happened then perhaps it wasn't done no and, and, and again that might be the weakness of the research in, in sort of time and scope really Three days. yeah that's my fault yeah, yeah. But, blame the but, host yeah but it doesn't so yeah <laughs> um but it doesn't jump out at you it sort of it sits there as well that's obvious that's what you do but with many of the things that we do have as that's an obvious thing to do there's sometimes an explanation and I just haven't come across it too yet you know uh, bearing in mind as well that people do treat sort of machine guns as you know the single entity and don't necessarily talk about Beezers, brownings or, or or anything different they just treat it as sort of one um one lump in an index which makes research incredibly difficult uh but it's an interesting um you know potential use for the repetition and, and, and it's that that made me think why you can put in these guns back to single shot um so yeah any you know a slight divergence from from the Bisa there you know in the ammunition problems uh that it had but yes you know this is this is not loading ammunition belts this is checking ammunition belts and refilling boxes because they've moved around in the tank and have probably um you know come out of the belt slightly which will cause a, a feed block stoppage uh it's all so on one of the bits of paper that we do have in the collection um or have had in the past is like a duty card for for the Churchill tank crew and if they stop let's say if they stop for longer than 20 minutes um this was something they had to do so it was like a uh, an immediate halt so just 
um, you know, tasks to do then. 20 minute halt, you know, cup of tea cut time, and then longer than 20 minutes and, and you know, work through these tasks, one of which is to check the ammunition, oil the guns and uh, work through all that. So, yeah, um, click, click, click over to the next slide then, Woody. Let's see. Let's see what I put there. Um, the Beezers, oh, we talked about anti-aircraft. So this is uh, a sort of short lived affair that I just wanted to show where we end up with machine guns only on tanks um and this is a a mark a mark six tank as an anti-aircraft tank i think it's light tank anti-aircraft mark one actually just to upset the nomenclature of life um because by the time we go to the light tank mark seven uh that's the tetrak so sixth airborne armored reconnaissance regiment um stuff you know they've got two pounder and visa on that but the, 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 you know, this photo that we've got here is four visas set up as an anti-aircraft um sort of mobile position but but that's it then you know that after that ta the machine gun is purely secondary armament uh and 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 we move on yeah and we get to the point in the middle of the war where particularly the americans start putting quad mounted 50 cals on half tracks things like that. so the anti-aircraft yeah. role starts getting assigned to other types of vehicles away from the tanks um um, about apologies, folks, but for some reason I can't share your comments on screen tonight. I don't know why there's something issue with StreamYard, but I can. So I've got another window open with what you're saying on YouTube. So um, inevitably, there's some conversations going on about ammunition and tracer. And when, when we talked about the target indication, yep. um, what was the, Do we know anything about the makeup of ammunition in the Bisa? One in five. One in five. If you want numbers, one in five for Bisa. Um, the only time you see mixed bouts. Uh, actually stamped out or anything like that is four weapons in um, either armor or aircraft. So the infantry don't have mixed bouts. Um, yeah, we don't need we, we infantry. Get me, I don't carry stuff. Um, but we, you know, they, they don't have them for overhead fire, barrage fire, or anything like that. There's no need because you can't see the stuff anyway. It'll have burnt out. Um, but you do have that mix, and because the only sights that you've got. Uh, from inside the turret or a telescope through the armor. Uh, and most of these guns are short range down to 2,000 yards on the sights anyway. So they've got a short tangent sight rather than yeah. the full yeah. 2,700. They're not expected to do anything. Um, they're not expected to do anything much more than 600 yards by the looks of it. But yeah, one in five, one in five was the mix on the tracer and the ammunition bouts came pre-packed for that. They didn't, there's none of this sort of having to strip out boxes and cartons to, to load stuff. Um, yeah. One in five simple numbers. Cool. Oh, are we, are we ready for the brownie? Yeah, yeah, we're let's, let's do. Yeah, I, I, I could talk about fifteen mil bees a little bit, but there's probably not because um, it doesn't appear for very long. I think that's that's probably what I wanted to say. Fifteen mil bees. Um, there's only like three thousand of those guns made during the war. Fifty-five thousand of the um, seven point nine two um, bees made by BSA. Yeah, it's one of the reasons they become Beezers. So um, all those Birmingham small arms bikes that are out there uh, and Lewis guns, but they end up being made. But one of the, so we get Beezers on the British tanks uh, that I talked about, but on our American tanks that we end up in service with, we end up with Brownings. Um, why? Uh, because none of the British stuff that we have fits. Quite simply, what you can't change the the gimbal or the you know the the the, um, the mountings inside a a tank very easily, you know, un unless you're doing something radical like a firefly. And why would you do that when you've got the you know the guns, the tanks available to you, and the machine guns? So they're coming across with Brownings. What that does do though is puts another ammunition type in the mix. So mm. we then have uh, 1306 uh, coming in. And bear in mind, in British service, this is the only, you know, unless somebody comes up with something radical, this is the only uh, weapon that we have that's in 0.300, uh, you know, caliber 30, uh, that M1906 round that the Americans have. Everything out. So, so suddenly an armored division has the potential to have 303, 7.92, and point, uh, point 0.300 as it. It's ammunition mix. Now, that sort of jumps out as a problem, a logistics problem. But then if you think about how these tanks were being distributed, you know, quite often um, you're not really mixing up too much. Uh, you know, the tanks are largely in, in at least troop uh, of the same tank. So, And then the, yeah. they have therefore the same guns. Um, 
so it doesn't become too much of a problem. Uh, you've got, you know, and you've got masses of spares uh, for this stuff as well. You know, Browning's are probably, probably the most frequently found machine gun in Northwest Europe. Um, well, definitely in Northwest Europe, but but probably in British uh, divisions anyway. I'd have to work out some numbers around Bren guns on that. But in 21st Army Group, it's going to be a close call between Browning's and Bren guns. Uh, and you've got a flexible type, which you know, is for the whole gunner. And then you've got a fixed type, which uh, exists as the coax, which is the, the, the next picture there. It's worth saying these are out of the British parts manual for the Browning. So this is, um, you know, this, this is how we were... You, setting up complete store systems to suit we weren't relying on american logistics to do this once it got to the uk you know we weren't sort of stuff wasn't being delivered into france um and then being split off it was coming into the uk british stores being you know managed by the british ministry of supply um you know ordered specifically for what we wanted so we've got the 30 cal brownings and let's say they, they they fit in the whole gunners position um or as coax guns and then um i've, I've included a, a couple of photos uh you know, this one there burma um 1945 cleaning the browning you know it's it's exactly the same weapon as they have in the american infantry uh we don't have that in any role in the british infantry unless they've nicked it. And quite simply, they Which, did. on behalf of the British Army, no one in the British Army has ever nicked anything ever. Uh, Found, liberated, <laughs> borrowed. Uh. Yes, borrowed <laughs> permanently. Um, but if you, if you go to the the, the next one, uh, you, you'll see that you know, the, these guys here, I think this is 13th, 18th Hussars, um, that Browning should not be on that carrier. Uh, quite simply, they've moved that from a vehicle it should be on and put it on a vehicle it shouldn't be on by rights. But of course, you know, it, it's not right. It, it's right, wrong. It doesn't matter. Um, I remember talking to a, uh, a, a small arm school corps veteran, actually, uh, who helped me with the, with the history. Um, a guy called Reg Timblick was in 2nd Kings Royal Rifle Corps. So they were a motor battalion supporting uh, you know, one of the uh, brigades in an armored div. And they just went, look, you know, we're going to fit every vehicle we've got with any weapon you know, the 50 cal Brownings that sat on the top of those Shermans are not being used as much as we would use them if they were sat on our carriers. So we're going to get them because we don't have to worry about finding ammunition for them because we're in the brigade. Uh, it's fine. Um, this this doesn't happen very easily in an infant, you know, in an infantry dip. So you see this, you go, OK, why have these guys got it? Um, this is probably an observer's carrier or something like that supporting regimental HQ for the 13th, 18th. Um, so, yeah, and, and then you, you see the 50 cal Brownings uh, being used there. The 50 cal Browning is that anti-aircraft weapon uh, on the tanks. You know, it, it's so not only have we got the whole gunner, the um, you know, your 10 Sherman supporting infantry going across a field in Normandy have got two 30 cal machine guns, but then the commander giving it Billy Big on top with a 50 cal as well if he wants to. So it's, yeah, it. it it's quite that element, you know, quite that area of support if you're just up against infantry. They're, they're being very, very useful um, supporting tanks. Uh, 50 cal, I've, I've showed you the sort of 50 cal browning round. Again, it's not something that appears outside of the armoured div. Um, so we don't have to worry about how we supply that. You know, it simplifies things if we keep just giving this stuff to, um, you know, to the individual units and, uh, yeah, and, and perhaps the special forces as well, but certainly... You know, we'll keep it to these guys as as uh, correctly as possible. Um, the next photo, I think, is 30 cal of, I think this is King's Royal Rifle Corps, um, and this is the 30 cal that they've dismounted. And what it looks like they've done sacrilegiously, that mount that it's sat on is the mount for a Vickers machine gun from a universal carrier. So I don't know whether they've... Um, so this is the mount that sits in the middle that allows you to fire at 360 from a universal carrier. Uh, I don't know what they've done with that Vickers, but I'd very much be scared they've thrown that away or thrown it in the back of a carrier um, and swapped it with a Browning that they're being able to use, which is then pointless because it feeds from the wrong side. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's just another uh, example of redeploying these weapons into an infantry role, which, yeah, yeah, the Brownings in armored devs are clearly easy to, to, to access. Um, 
Browning, Browning's a really interesting gun. We'd actually trialed it in the 20s and 30s. So the yeah, it's an M1919. Yeah, the year gives it away. And the 50 cal is M1921. We decided we didn't need that. Uh, we were able to home source uh, the weapons that we wanted. So we give, um, so when these come along, you know, these are just purely American made. We do produce our own version of a Browning, but that's only for aircraft. Uh, and actually we do it in 303 as well. We don't decide to adopt this in 303, which is interesting. You know, we're happy with that 30, that other mix coming in at this late stage of the war, which probably shows the industrial nature of the war, you know, mm. or 42 onwards anyway, um, that we just know we're going to get this stuff. We're never going to have shortages of ammunition or not to any great extent. Um, so we're happy with 1306. We do make some of our own and these stay in service right up until the 1990s, really, with the armored vehicles, uh, Royal Engineers that are going into uh, Operation Desert Storm and the Gulf War. So, yeah, they have they've been converted to 762 by that point or we've, yeah, we've made some stuff. But the 30 cal Browning is the one that sees everybody out. The Beezer goes out of service in 19, uh, 1949. Um, Browning stays there forevermore. Yeah, so. I mean, what I'm, th I'm thinking, I've got various things going. I'm trying to monitor the, the, the comments coming on right. YouTube as well. And people are asking about, you know, uh, they're talking about cloth belts and metal belts. Someone did ask with, with the bees going back to the bees, where we were, whether we were able to, to use a German ammunition, because I think it's something yes. that you, you read about, um, yeah. but not, they'd have to take it from the belts and put it into their own belts. But yes, yeah, they it's not something we can do suddenly and, you know, dramatically in the middle of a, an engagement but yes we could we could use that it stuff was, we? it was used and um yeah, one of the manuals that arrived the other day has got this little table oh, see, um regimental officer's guide to the german army 1943 in the back of it's like this little table of compatibility and yeah 792 and nine mil for example are ones that if you capture big supplies make sure they go back up the uh, supply chain reverse supply chain in, in 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 today's terminology get back into the system um you know give it to a grown-up that can do something properly with it don't try and manage it yourself um because there's all these risks and concerns of sabotage and things like that if the enemy start to know what we're doing with it uh but yeah 7.92 can be used it is exactly the same uh and that comes from the fact that it's a czech development in the 1930s yeah um, we'll just do. I've got a lot more things yeah. I want to mention. And is that there's the things in my head I want to mention. We'll just go through your your last. Yeah, I've got a couple, kind of, couple of slides left free for all discussion. But um, yeah, th th this one really is a, it's a stowage sketch there from the National Archives. Um, you can see the reference number at the bottom there if you if you want to dig it out or just ping me a note. Um, there's a series of these stowage sketches for a Churchill one, and what it does is just illustrates the other weapons. Um, because I've talked about ammunition and logistics and supply. And that's great, you know, at divisional level. But once you're in a tank and you start to think, well, look, my Churchill 1 has its gun, its, um, you know, its main armament. It then has its Beza with 7.92 ammunition. It then has a Bren with 303 ammunition for anti-aircraft use. And you can see that top right circle there, the 100 round drum mag, which is the one that we saw on the Churchill. It's probably a Mach 4 or something by the time um, we've got, yeah, by the time we've got there. So, uh, it, Top left, it was sorry the the hundred round drum mag mentioned, but then we've got um on the on the right hand side there we've got the Thompson mentioned, which is forty five, um, yeah point four five. Sensible heads would make you think that if you've got point four five ammunition, what you're going to do is give them point four five inch automatic pistols, but you don't do that because that would be sensible. So you give them thirty eight revolvers as well. Um, you've then got um signal pistols, uh, yeah. and yeah. you you've got loads of stuff. Um, and you, uh, loads of ammunition in the tank. So this is what I started to come across was when you look at the stowage numbers and the decisions, or you start to think about the decisions that are made for, well, how many rounds of 303 are you going to carry versus how many rounds of 7.92 versus how many, what's the mix going to be on a per tank basis? And it really does come down to that role, it seems. Somebody will have thought about that. Um, some operational research group will have done the study. Somebody will have ignored that study and just come up with what fits well. Um, but it but it does sort of uh, lead you to think, well, look, if I run out of Bren gun ammunition, I have to get 303 from somewhere because it's the only weapon in my tank that uses it. If I run out of 7.92, so what do I use? Do I use the Bren because I'm in close support with infantry uh, you know, from the top? Uh, it just it's a really interesting sort of decision that today we just go, oh, it's 762. 
or it's five five six. You know, it's seven six two largely until you know, until we start to get to the individual personal weapons. Um, we don't have to worry about it. So this was just a great step sketch to show the sort of diversity of ammunition that we've got in there um and then just the one last slide i think is the bren being in that anti-aircraft role sat on the top of a matilda 2 i think which shows you know main gun 7.92 millimeter beezer alongside that gun uh bren uh up in up in the air there and then the smoke discharges and if you just zoom in on those uh you'll you know People that do know their weapons will recognize the end of them uh, because that is cut off SMLE action. So Lee Enfield rifle actions um, that they've just got. Well, we've got loads of Lee Enfield rifles about. How do we get things to fire? Well, let's just cut it off, put a big tube on it, and somebody in 70 years' time will say it's a Star Wars blaster. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it'll appear on the collector's market and get 10 times the amount. Um, but you know, that, that's all they did. It was fired by wire from inside the tank. One of the things with these anti-aircraft um, guns you know, is, is a, 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 we've got the Bren in all the photos, but sat behind me, which way am I going to go? That is a Vickers K, so the uh, gas-operated Vickers, which was also used as that sort of high rate of fire light anti-aircraft gun. And these fitted on a, um, a mounting well, the Brens did as well, but I like talking about Vickers K's more. Um, the, you know, they, they fit on a mounting that can actually be remote fired from inside the tank, so it can be it can be tipped, um, but can also be you know worked up the PLM mount. Uh, so they were thinking about you know, again, they were thinking about these guns and how they were going to be used. You, know, you use a machine gun on a really flexible mount that can be fired while you've got the turret, you know, the, the hatches closed. Um, high rate of fire for ground use and for you know, and for anti-aircraft use as well because if you're firing an, an aircraft uh, that's coming towards you strafing you you probably want to have those hatches closed um so you need a remote fired mount so they clearly thought about the technology that goes behind some of this stuff mm. uh, you know, and it's just this this real mix of of everything um going in together that like i say i'm sure we'll be able to find in the research putting this together but it's not obvious so one you know it's a fascinating i think you know from a sort of machine gun researcher perspective it's an absolutely fascinating topic to get stuck into yeah and the way my my, my brain is going now one of the things like it'll seem like this doesn't have any connection with what we're talking about at all but i will bring it back to the subject in a minute i've been asked many times as a tour guide in normandy what was the weather like on d-day what was it you know, what was it sunny? Was it rainy? And I said, well, I've met, you know, I have many, a thousand Normandy veterans, D-Day veterans. They never mentioned the weather on D-Day. And they go, that's interesting. So, well, no, it isn't interesting because it's so low on the list of things they're giving any thought to that day because there's keeping alive, there's seasickness, there's bombs going overhead, there's aircraft going ahead, there's being shot at by little guns, there's being shot at by big guns, so on and so on and so forth. So I'm wondering whether the the, the reason there isn't that much stuff about the, the, sub, the machine guns in tanks is that on the list of things, when the when tank commanders are going back and they're writing up reports and, and, and the same other like things that they do in America, the Fort Benning reports and the British after, after combat reports, they're talking about engine maintenance is very important. You know, whether the engine breaks down in the middle of a battle is very, very important. Whether your big gun works or doesn't work against the stuff you're shooting at is very important. Whether your armor is protecting you against the stuff that's coming at you is very, very important. How your crew is performing is very, very important. But how far down the list is machine gun effectiveness? And I'm just wondering whether it's just it's if we had if these people had been interviewed to the interview part two, it might have come up. If someone said, Oh, and by the way, how did the machine guns go? Oh, well, we found this was this, yeah, we found that was effective there, or the, the belts had got you know we we hadn't been checking the, the rounds in the belts enough in the beaters or something like that but it just it never quite got that far in a conversation does that make any sense to you yeah it does absolutely and i i, I think you're right and i think what you've got to also remember about small arms is um you know as i can attest to you know and those that have seen social media that related to our channels in the, in the or my channel in the last few days or historic firearms or anybody like that will see that we were out on saturday firing the vickers quite a lot and we had four guys there that haven't fired it quite a lot. You know, I wasn't in uniform doing stuff that day, but they managed to resolve things quite quickly themselves with about five minutes of tuition. And I think one of the things about small arms and machine guns, 
why you don't write about this stuff is because unless it's a catastrophic problem failure, you've resolved it yourself um, or the gunner has resolved it. So why does the commander need to know? And then why does it need to be passed up? You know, things like uh, take the things that I have spotted about Bisa ammunition in the past, primers don't work. Well, that's a batch issue. That's a big issue. Ordnance officers like to know that stuff. Um, but the fact that it overheated because you were firing 25 round bursts, not 15 round bursts, or, you know, or you, uh, and the other thing is you don't necessarily know what the effect of your fire is all the time. So one of the things that I looked at for these accounts is clearly tank accounts. But what I need to go and look at and and maybe others have as well, you know, is the infantry accounts. So though you know the um you know, lion rampant and things like that, what do they say about the the support that the tanks were giving them? And I know from some other things that have, have been some other random questions that social media has presented me recently about Victoria Cross actions. Yeah, you know, the Bisa gets mentioned in a Victoria Cross citation because an infantry officer gets up on the tank and starts directing the tank and the fire of all of its guns to support the infantry in their action. So it is one of those things that unless it's really special, unless it's really different, exceptional mm. comment, you just don't mention it. Yeah, um, I went through some of my stuff and because I've got a nice file of stuff about hedgerows and bocards, because I did a film, Hedrows yeah, and Bocards. Yeah, you did a very nice film. Um, there, there are some nice diagrams in the American military about the eventual breakthrough hedgerows, where they put the crossfire from coaxials in corners of hedgerows, but only in the diagrams. There's nothing in the text to accompany it. The text is all yep. about the tanks making, uh, well, the engineers blowing up gaps in the hedgerow, the tanks moving through that, and then the diagram just shows yeah, yeah, and you put crossfire in the corners there. And that I found that was interesting that it, it did it one way and the other. The other account, and it, uh, with those who remember watching the show with Jenny Grant uh, in the Fallet's Gap last August, is when the poles were stuck on the on the mace there, there's that brilliant account by that lieutenant colonel where there's a, two troops of Sherman tanks there and all the whole... In fact, I think it's the best part of a regiment's machine guns are firing because the, the anti-aircraft ones are, on the, on, are firing backwards into the woods where the Germans are coming up, up at them. And the coaxials are all firing forwards at Germans there because the commander is worried about Germans climbing on his tank and kind of dropping grenades down the turret. And that's this big dramatic account where when a regiment's entire complement of machine guns are firing, yes, it made the account. But when you're looking at the events before and afterwards, Obviously, they were using them, before, but not in that same amazing, dramatic way. So it only got mentioned when it became big enough to bother to write down. And so, you know, I, but again, the other thing is, like you said, with indexes, I don't. I was looking for machine gun references and indexes, and not, not much was coming up. So I could have reread every book I own in the last two days and just made a mental note if ever tank machine gun fire came up. But I hadn't got that time. But yeah, my time on Google, my time looking at there's just not much out there. Tankencyclopedia.com, there's not much there about tank machine guns. And I feel it kind of it's weird. Again, I say what we beginning of the show that there hasn't been much of a study into this. Um, it's really no, intriguing. It is. And and I think if you if you think that step further, and I talked about it in those la that la those last two slides, you know, the bomb throwers, the smoke dischargers. Uh, you know, th there is actually some stuff in the manuals about when they should be used and what they're used for. And smoke discharges, you know, bomb throwers will throw smoke uh, about 175 yards. Um, it says, but really keep it closer than that. You know, that's the max effective range. Um yeah, so they're not throwing it that far. They're for immediate protection of the tank between you and the anti-tank gun that is that is trying to attack you. Um, nothing else. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we know they exist. We know they're supposed to be used. I'm sure they were used, but it's you know unless uh, unless there's sort of that mention of and then we threw smoke. And you sort of think, well, did they throw smoke, or what? You know, what was it? You have to you have to understand the context of what they're doing. These things aren't going to get mentioned either. Um, well, a couple of uh, things that I did find were about dismounting the Bren gun. Let's use the Bren gun, um, you know, particularly when they go off on scouting patrols and stuff on foot and things like that. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're taking the Bren gun with them um, and the Thompsons or or the Sten machine carbines. Um, yeah, they're going off on those. And it, it's an interesting area. Uh, small arms researchers get fascinated and, and sort of 
fixated on the abnormal as well or on the myth. Um, so if you want to look up tank small arms, all you will find, or not all you will find, that's millions of people in Tesco's thing. But you know, a lot of a lot of the information you'll find is well, the tanky pistol. You know, mm. that it misses the hammer. Well, it's a complete myth. You know, it, it's not because they were tankies. It's because they didn't want to train people to fire um, single ac fire single action and double action revolvers. It takes too long. So, and it doesn't matter if it's thirty yards away, you'll hit it. If it's not, you don't need to aim. Um, but you know, the technically minded small arms researcher focuses on that. And it's like, well, what about all these other weapons that are related to tanks and how they were, um, how they were used? Other than, let's say, other than the main gun, other than the seventeen pounder, six pounder, or three inch, whatever. You know, it it changes it changes dramatically. And I yeah, I mean, was, we should we should just you know cover the fact that the tank. You know, you read read Ken Tout's books; they had Sten guns and things like that. Yeah. There, and you, you know, the document you showed earlier, uh, Thompson's, um, and as you say, they've all got. Most RTR and RAC guys seem to have what a variant of the holster, the droppy down one or the not droppy down one with a 38 or something else. Um, again, have we read many accounts of them actually being used? I only remember ones of them when it's bringing prisoners back. That's what I tend to yep. remember um, is drawing of a pistol because you've captured some enemy tank commander and you're bringing him back to you. But I don't, in movies, I'm sure tank commanders are frequently using their pistols. But again, I don't know that it's something that you're re I've read about happening very often. I can completely get why they have protection. If you bail out of, any, of a tank and you've got nothing else, having a pistol there gives you a sense of being able to take care of yourself. But again, there's not much um, written down. Just while we, Nicholas Patton has asked, are there any, any tables on tank machine gun ordnance totals used? Would there would be something that would indicate how much ammunition was issued and how much was used? Because that 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 might be interesting. Yeah, I mean, you'd sort of have to pick out the 7.92 millimeter Beezer and just focus on that. Um, yeah. you'd, you, you might get the 30, uh, 30 not six in British service. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we've got some of the contract ledgers for buying that stuff. Uh, there was lots, you know, I, I know that much, if I remember rightly, um, you know, 7.92, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of racking the back of my brain now from when I looked at this about 18 months ago, but 303 is up there, 303 isn't the biggest amount of ammunition we end up buying, actually, I think it's 0.177 air pellet, or something like that, and then we gradually um, get, get to 303, then 20 mil for the RAF, uh, it's, 7.92 is up there above nine mil because you're using it. If you are using it, you're using a lot of it and you're also uh, using a lot of it in training as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we are training a lot of people to fire these guns. Um, so we're, we're getting through uh, a lot of it. So yeah, um, that would be a really great source to, to tap into a little bit more about how much of that ends up in the field and how much. Yeah. Of that, and, you know, and wasted yeah. and how, whether it was yeah. given back and whether that, yeah, that those kind of thing there's, you know, you said before you went live, there's definitely, I've whetted your appetite to go and do some yeah. more work on this. And it's a, yet another thing like I get all the time to add to the list of things that you, you'll you never get round to, but eventually you will. And um, I want to bring back to a question Ray, Ray asked on Facebook, Ray Maroney asked, uh, who joined me on my Saturday show live when I was rabbiting on for four hours. He's asking basically to condense um, what what the whole thing about us doing the British doing the deals with the Czechoslovakian government in the 30s, the bees of the Bren gun? What, what, why why did we end up going to Czechoslovakia for our for our light machine guns and tank guns? What was there any particular reason for that? Were we looking at other nations? It was just was there yeah. a backhander somewhere as a brown envelope <laughs> left in Lambeth somewhere? I don't, what was the <laughs> Uh, certainly not not that's recorded in the ordnance board memoranda or the uh, or the national archives um but uh, they had the best weapons on offer at the time you know zb uh, bruno uh, be the, be it the the bren the zb30s uh 30, 33 that becomes the bren um or the zb53 that becomes the Beza. it it it's one of those things that it, every decade almost has its best weapons manufacturer um you know it's learned from different periods and and, and stuff but to the 30s it seems to have been um bruno and we adopt it they are happy to give us licenses to produce which is one of the reasons why we don't end up with some of the other weapons so we don't end up with vickers bertier for example because vickers won't give the royal small arms factory the license to produce it and we realized that everything's stepping up and we want sovereign capability around some of this stuff. You know, everybody likes you know, made in Britain on things at this point. And even though we've gone to a Czech design that we've tweaked, um, made working with 303, 
it's still made in Britain. So, you know, it comes over an Enfield lock, produce that. And then BSA produced the the Beezer under license as well. So mm. it, it does, it, we do trial it against um, Brownings. We, we trial all of these different weapons. We trial some random stuff that Vickers are producing as well. Um, some sort of new, new made things. Uh, I think there's an element of, we want something that's not Vickers actually uh which is a really interesting sort of problem of the arms industry at the time uh, and we want a new manufacturer in the mix and so i don't think it's necessarily that we want bruno uh but it's they come up with the best overall procurement offer um yeah again, yeah um get me thinking defense industry stuff but they, they come up with the best offer uh and you know, we can produce it ourselves so it works for everybody's favor then at the end of the day, they, um, you know, obviously get taken over, uh, annexed, and uh, we are quite thankful for the fact that we can make them ourselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and and yeah, and interesting. And Ray mentions again the fact that the the Germans who were much closer to Czechoslovakia didn't go down the route, the 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 Bezer and Bren route and. Just as well, no, they really. They'd be thirty. Um, you know, yeah. they, they do adopt the Bren for some some stuff, but you know, the, let's not get into a German machine gun um, conversation. Um, but it's uh, no, because we haven't of... invited Nick Bad for a start. Yeah, so we can't yeah. do it properly. It'd only be a, a bad uh, attempt. But yeah, uh, but yeah, exactly. We'll get it wrong. Uh, but yeah, they have their mind set on their universal machine gun machine and gewehr um, approach, which does isn't something that Bruno are offering. You know, we are looking for a magazine-fed air-cooled weapon. We are then looking for a bout-fed air-cooled weapon for our medium machine gun. Um, we actually change our... The reason we don't end up with it replacing the Vickers is we go, well, we want an air-cooled weapon that can do sustained fire, and really, there's no such thing. Um, and when we get to the general-purpose machine gun sort of in the late 1950s, we've changed our mind. We've said, well, we want an air-cooled weapon that can sort of do sustained fire. Um, just we don't need it for as long now because the world has changed. Mm. We don't need to sit in a single place and pile tens of thousands of rounds into a single position. So the world has changed um, and we're much more mobile as a result. So the bees there, if it had come along at that point, might well have been the gun for us. Yeah. Um, picking up on what you were saying about you know, cloth belts disintegrating metal link or anything like that, just as a, you know, there's no disintegrating link inside the tanks because that creates a problem um, as it's churned out of the gun. So these are all cloth belt fed um, weapons uh, other than, sorry, they're all um, solid belt. The bees about are metal, uh, but they aren't disintegrating. So you know, it, it's you don't want bits of link flying around inside the tank that would put or getting on the floor and slipping over and things. So, so changing the slots, the tax slide just to kind of we'll round things off fairly soon. But you know, you've done a lot more work on, for example, the Middlesex Regiment and the Cheshire Regiment, and the machine guns in that environment, and, and with that, and we could do that in a separate show at some other point, and I would like to do that, but. Yeah. We know that those regiments have been working like crazy to work on the use of carriers, deployment, mobility, how to range the weapons, what you can use them for. Um, in this combined arms idea we're getting towards 1944 and everything working together, I'm assuming you would have already found if officers or instructors in the Middlesex Regiment had gone to the RTR, to, for example, to give their use of, okay, this is how we do it. This is how we move carriers across the ground. This is what we've learned with regards to machine gun fire and mobility. That if that if there had been some kind of cross pollination, you would have discovered that in your research in the Middlesex. I'm pretty sure, yeah. So I, I have found that for the artillery, for example. Once you get 4.2 inch mortars, counter mortar firing up, there's that cross pollination. There's certainly nothing being talked about from an armor. Um, infantry support or infantry m maneuver uh, uh, and things like that area. Um, where, where I'm going is, is yeah. if if the RTR have fought themselves in that kind of 43 period when we're we're building up to get back in ETO and everything, it's a lot of stuff on Salisbury Plain. Thanks, Gareth. Yesterday, if the RTR RAC had felt there was they needed to 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 um, look at how they're using machine guns in their armored vehicles. It's not like there isn't someone to ask. They they could have easily brought oh, yeah. people across from the infantry and said, "Look, hey, we we'd like to work with you and see what we can develop." And and so the, the, the middle sector were never asked. The churches were never asked. The RTR yeah. probably never asked them. So it, it it implies that whatever they've got planned for machine guns, they feel that 
whatever they've got planned is going to be sufficient. I mean, Gareth will have ended up, I'm saying. Yeah, Gareth will have ended up in the gunnery wing at Lulworth. And, and you know, the small arm school corps instructors that are there teaching, um, you know, 30 male and, and, and downwards um, are you know, the same same sort of structure that they had there in the Second World War. So in studying the war establishments of, of all of these different organizations, um, and it's just worth picking up, I said about you know, making things easy by just segregating tanks and then for segregating machine guns. The difficult place was the training regiment Royal Armoured Corps because you had to train somebody on everything because you didn't quite know where they were going yet. Um, but those training regiments had all of those different types of guns. They had you know, machine gun instructors that would have also taught or been trained at Netheraven, the machine gun school or the small arms wing, uh, small arms school, Netheraven wing, which you know, machine guns and mortars and a bit of anti-tank. There would have been that cross pollination there at an instructor level. Um, but if you, even, but there's nothing that seems to feed back or uh, exist as you know conversations about actually you know can can tank. I suppose one of the big questions is can tank machine guns support infantry in the same way an infantry machine gun can? You know, so mm. because you've got it on a vehicle, um, and if you think about the structure of an armored division, you would think, well, wait a minute, okay, so we've got all these machine guns in tanks. Yet we still need an infantry machine gun, uh, um, an independent machine gun company from the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers to support the infantry in our in our division. So we're not reliant solely on the machine guns of the tanks to do so, uh, which, which I suppose is one of those quite answers where you go, yeah, maybe they did have that conversation and they decided it wouldn't work. Um, hmm. Uh, and interestingly, we don't know whether there's anyone else watching this who knows about an equivalent program in the German army or Italian army yeah. or American army. Maybe they, one of those other armies did do, do more about how to use their tank machine guns in, in combat. But I'm just thinking, and we will bring things in, 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 in battles like Goodwood, for example, where the margins were pretty fine, people still debate whether that was a German victory and a, a, a draw. Or a, a, like, you know, it's still debated. If there had been some clear doctrine, doctrinal approach to the use of a, the tank division's secondary weapons and everybody was singing to that same hymn sheet, it might have just theoretically upped our capability by 1%. And that 1% overall might have just made a bit of a difference in that battle if, if there was some collected collected idea behind how we're going to use these secondary weapons and we will you, we will resort to... Plan seventy three on this occasion, which is all the anti aircrafts doing guns doing something, um, it might have given us an edge. It's just interesting that if if we're if we've overlooked it as historians, because they've overlooked it at the time, maybe there is a there was there is something that could have been improved upon. Yeah, completely. And you know, we, we, you've seen what we put out, like say in the manuals and the archive that we've put online. Yeah, we continue to push. Where we continue to source all the military training pamphlets um, that we can. You know, we, we started off just looking at those machine gun related ones, but we're gradually working through all the operations pamphlet number twenty three. Yeah, you know, thankfully our patrons are, are supporting us in building that archive at the moment, and you know it's it's answering some of those questions. Yeah, we finally got together. Um, a relatively complete set of the army training memoranda uh some of that you can buy from naval and military press but they don't have them all uh despite it being a complete set um yeah the, there's some missing in the middle uh we've got all those you can learn these doctrine changes throughout so we're continuing to do so you know and it's one of those things that maybe we'll come across it and this has been a really sort of interesting speculative kind of research mm. question to ask and go well look where are the what? Where are the what is the scope of our knowledge? What are the limits of our knowledge as we sit here today? And we, you know, the, those that are watching may well know more on some of those limits, and that would be great to hear from and you know, get those comments about because it would be great to try and round this out and understand whether there is something massive we're overlooking, um, or whether it is you know an exemplar of one of those issues during the Second World War that was so far down everybody's agenda it didn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And yet, if we had someone like Ramsey Green, our mutual friend on talking about rations, a hell of a lot of thinking was put into rations, which I know everyone's going to eat every day, but it seems that there's a lot of thought goes into everything in a war at some point. You know, then the most minor thing, there's panels, there's committees, there's MOD people going, let's think about this, let's think about that. And it, you know, it is interesting. I'll go back to what we said at the beginning. It's interesting that there, we haven't yet, you and I, in a few days, found much about a a 
combined idea about how to use a, a an armored divisions or armored uh, uh, units machine guns to any kind of prescribed yeah, the, set the, of the, rules for no, want of a better expression. The doctrine seems to sit around tanks as an entity, not around the separate elements of, the of them. Yeah. Which is interesting. So, well, I think we'll, we're going to end up going around in circles now. So that I've, as, as usual, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking to you, Rich. And um, it reminds me of sitting in hedgerows in Normandy with you and going to things like that with brain guns and stuff. And you were my, you were my corporal once, weren't you? I think, or you were, were you allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, anyway, a long, long time ago, but um, yeah. 20, so if uh, anyone is watching this and they do have more information about, the use of secondary weapons within armored formations in World War II, be it American, British, German, Italian, anything, then maybe it will get the ball rolling. Maybe we can start some kind of start a little Facebook group or a Twitter little message thing and start yeah. sharing some information. Because a lot of people out there who know a lot, and maybe we've just overlooked it, but it's interesting to start it off. So thanks for joining us, Rich. It's been really great. And we'll we'll do something else with you about the use Absolutely. of machine guns in the in the the, the, the line regiments if you'd like to at some point yeah um, for those watching of course we've got uh neil's tomorrow talking about german armor divisions in normandy that will bust some myths i think about just exactly what the germans had available to them apart upon the uh allied in uh, invasion of june 6 1944 so there we are thanks rich again i will say end the stream and i will see you all again on world war ii tv tomorrow and don't forget folks check the links below you can find the Vickers Machine Gun Association, they've got, they're like us, they rely on patrons and help, and they've got a shop like us, all the links are there below, so do check out what Rich and his team are doing, because there's amazing, amazing information there um, about machine guns, so thanks everybody for watching, cheers Rich, I will see you again, I will see you, for, for the audience, I will see you all tomorrow.